Uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman, and I work here in the Author Events Office, and I always wheedle my way into introducing authors whose work I love. So tonight, I'm very excited to be here to introduce to you George Saunders. Uh, having garnered wide readership and critical praise for his surreal, darkly funny, utterly humane fiction, I found that word coming up again and again uh, as I wrote this in reviews. Uh, the New York Times says that, quote, no one writes more powerfully than George Saunders about the lost, the unlucky, the disenfranchised. He is the author of the New York Times notable books, Pastoralia and Civil War Land in Bad Decline. Uh, he is a story finalist for in, uh, in Persuasion Nation, and he is the author of 10th of December, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and on just about every best of the year list that I came across. Uh, he's also one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential peop People, and his many honors include a Guggenheim and a MacArthur Fellowship. And he also has been recognized by the American Academy of Arts and Letters and has won four National Magazine Awards. His latest book is also his first novel. Colson Whitehead calls it, quote, a luminous feat of generosity and humanism. There's human again. Zadie Smith calls it a masterpiece. Mr. Saunders simply calls it Lincoln in the Bardo. In it, the eponymous 16th president suffers the profound grief of a father who has lost a child as the Civil War rends the nation asunder and also shows us a bizarre purgatorial afterlife populated with howling, griping, quarrelsome, all too familiar ghosts. And it's funny, and there's Buddhism. Uh, and here to tell us more about it, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome George Saunders to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great, great to be back here. I, I was just thinking, you know, um, you're, you're on Time's list of the 100 most influential people, and you go, ooh, look what the world is like right now. I should, I should I'm gonna take that off my resume. <laughs> I didn't do it. I, uh, yeah, oh God. All right. So um, thank you for being here. I uh, this basically this uh, you know about four years ago when 10th of December came out, one of my shtick items was no, I've never written a novel and I don't want to. You know, n novelists are weak people. They go on and on. You know, uh, <laughs> and um, but. Uh, about 20 something years ago, my wife and, and our daughters and I were, were in DC and my wife's cousin, we were driving by Oak Hill Cemetery and my wife's cousin just offhandedly said, did you know that when Lincoln was president, his, uh, his son died, which I didn't know, uh, and that he was in that crypt right up there and that Lincoln was so grief stricken that he went into the crypt on several occasions, according to newspaper accounts at the time. And that just really hit me, you know, as, as a young father, and also at the time the Clinton scandal was going on, and I thought, how do you leave the White House alone? You know, it just kind of got in my head. But I had a writing teacher one time tell me that there are kind of two types of ideas. Uh, the ideas that you write and the ideas that you think about writing, and that you can save years of your life if you can tell the difference, you know? <laughs> like, like the, you know, the, hey, a penguin, a penguin orgy, that's, you know, no, 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 that's not, you know. <laughs> So um, I, pr I pretty much put this idea into that category mainly because of a shortcoming that I had, uh, have, which is that I, uh, you know, my, my f career, such as it is, came out of humor and kind of a, a dark satire. That was kind of what I uh, learned to do first. So when I thought about that material, I thought, you know, there's no way I have the chops to do something as earnest as that. Uh, and way back before my first book, I had, uh, a bad experience with the novel, not not reading it, but writing it. Um, I had gone to this wedding in Mexico, and it was a really exotic thing, you know, like there was a male uh, model slash surfer and a radical Catholic priest, and and uh, we were really broke at the time. And I came back to my, my wife and I said, "Honey, you're sitting on a gold mine. I got this." And then I went for about a year and um, stayed up late and drank a bunch of coffee. And at the end of it, I had this 700-page uh, novel uh, called uh, "You Can." see how good it was, it was called La Boda de Eduardo. <laughs> you know, it's like, ooh, which I think means like Ed's wedding or something like that. So, <laughs> so I, I gave it to my wife and in the way that writers have, I said, just take your time, there's no rush at all, you know, and then I lingered outside the room where she was reading it. <laughs> and um, I never forget, this is no exaggeration, and it's funny now, 
But she was, uh, I looked in about five minutes later, and she was maybe on page three. And she just had her head in her hands. Like this. <laughs> you know? So, she, I mean, she knew what that had cost us as a family. So I was really reluctant to try any novels any, anymore. Um, but this one, um, you know, it, whenever I was happy, like if I finished a project that I liked, uh, or I just was in a good place, I would always think about that Lincoln idea. And after a while, it started to grate on me um, that I was too scared to try it. And <coughs> when I asked myself why, I would always say, well, it's got too much love in it, too much sincerity, too much pain, too much earnestness. I'm like, wow, what kind of writer are you? You know, you're going you're gonna to be on the grave. It's going to say, you know, infinitely delayed thing he very much longed to do. Um, so when the last book was about to come out, you know, there's, there's that period uh, where the manuscript's gone and you're just waiting. So I thought maybe I can make a little contract with myself, like a three-week, three-month contract to just fart around with this thing. And if it was a total disaster, no big deal. You know, I can just throw it away. So I, I started messing with this story. Uh, and it actually did kind of, you know, it kind of interested me and everything. So, um, but it's a weird story. And if you are a writer, you know that anything good that you're going to be able to do comes out of problems. You know, like you have some constraint that screws you up. Uh, sometimes it looks like a fatal, fatal problem. The extent to which you can work with it will often make, make the book. So in this one, I thought, okay, Lincoln goes to the graveyard at night. Uh, who is narrating that supper? You know, four score and seven years ago, no, four score and seven, seven minutes ago, I did come into this here graveyard. You know, th that, that I'd, the idea of doing 300 pages of Lincoln voice was, wasn't good. So I just kind of stumbled on this idea that who, who would be in a graveyard at night? Well, a drunk grave digger, no. Uh, and then, you know, ghosts, maybe ghosts are in the graveyard. So I had, yeah, that'd be kind of funny. We have Lincoln come into this uh, population of ghosts. Who are ghosts? Well, traditionally, uh, they're people who uh, either don't acknowledge that they're dead, which would definitely be me. Like if I keel over right now, I'm like, but I've got my tour to do, I can't. Uh, <laughs> or, or, you know, the people who in this life didn't get what they wanted, which interestingly is everybody, you know? <laughs> or it's also neurotics, <laughs> also a big category. So, um, but in this graveyard, there's a select group of, of these uh, 19th century ghosts who haven't been able to go on and they sort of have their world rocked by Lincoln suddenly appearing among them. Um, and then one of the other things that the, the form told me I needed was, um, you know, when, when you, a ghost is somehow categorically related to a dream sequence. And uh, one of my other teachers once said, you're allowed three dream sequences in your writing career, so don't waste them, you know. <laughs> so ghost, same, you know, because the writer has infinite capacity to invent a ghost, uh, the, r the reader at some point starts going, you're just, doing shtick, you know, you're just making shit up. Uh, and so in this book, it started to feel like th there was some historical spine needed. So what I did was I started, um, you know, again, trying to do that in different ways. And finally, I just thought, how do, how do I know all of this history? And the answer was, well, you know, you read it in about nine different books over the last 15 years. So I ended up sort of sampling. I just, I typed those sections out and then spent a bunch of time editing them and rearranging them into these sort of uh, chapters. So the book alternates between this uh, Bardo section where these ghosts are talking and then these historical sections where there's more, um, you know, kind of uh, facts. Um, and the whole thing takes place in one night in this graveyard on Oak Hill. Um, so we're I think the idea is we're going to do a dramatic reading. We haven't rehearsed it at all. I've never met any of these people, so it sh it's really nicely improvisatory. Um, so the moment that we're going to talk about here is that Lincoln uh, has just been to the crypt and he actually uh, holds his son's body. He, he doesn't mean to, but he sort of can't help it. And then afterwards, he sort of stumbles away, a, a little bit shocked at what he's done. And he's trying to leave, but he can't quite do it. He just can't quite reconcile himself to what's just happened. And he has that feeling that in leaving, he's really having to say goodbye. So he kind of just sits in this a bit of grass between two graves. Um, and in this scene, there are two ghosts who are central to the story who are now um, chasing him trying to bring him back to Willie so they can have this kind of final reconciliation. Um, Willie is back at the crypt being minded by this old uh, prude, uh, the reverend, he's a reverend. Um, so one of the, now <laughs> as if that's not enough, um, one of the conventions in this world is that when uh, a living person gets passed through by a ghost or co-occupied co by the ghost, the ghost gets this amazing ability to sort of read the person's mind and channel uh, the person's thoughts. Um, 
folks, it's a realist novel. Um, <laughs> and that little move there is also f it's forbidden. Like it's a little bit not too classy, and especially this Revan isn't, isn't in favor. It's kind of a bad thing to do. Okay, so let me introduce our readers, if I could, um, to, to myself as well. Um, so the, the hysterical, uh, hysterical, the hysterical narratives, no, the historical narratives are going to be read by Kate, <laughs> Kate, there's Kate, hi Kate, and Janine, Janine. And then uh, the first of our ghosts is named Hans Volman, and that's going to be Murray. Murray, are you here? Hi, Murray. Now, this is, I, I, uh, Volman is a ghost, and um, they're, if some of these ghosts, if they're stuck for a certain reason, they'll actually have physical manifestations in the Bardo realm. So Volman is stuck here because um, he died just before he was about to consummate his marriage with his beautiful young wife. So, <coughs> so his manifestation is he's, he's a 19th century former printer, He's naked, <laughs> and, he, and, he ha and he has a tremendously large erection. <laughs> it's this is good typecasting. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, 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 about the size of a schnauzer, if you, if you would. <laughs> Take it away, Murray. Uh, and then we have a ghost called Roger Bevins III, who is going to be Austin. Austin, are you here? Hi, Austin. So Austin is, uh, I mean, not Austin, <laughs> but uh, Bevins is a, a young guy who it was a, a suicide, and in the last seconds of his life, he just realized he was making a mistake and changed his mind uh, and became sort of beautifully aware of how gorgeous the world is and all its sensual details. So his manifestation is that he would have hundreds of additional sensory organs like ears and eyes and mouths, and he's always reaching for things and bringing them closer to himself, uh, kind of like, a, like Shiva, something like that. Uh, so I'll be reading uh, Abe Lincoln. Uh, Save that part for myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll be doing Jesus. Uh, <laughs> but and so Lincoln is the only living person in this bit, and uh, so all of his neurosis is still, you know, like ours in in, in his head. Uh, okay, and uh, Andy, you're going to read the chapter headings, right? Okay, so this is going to be a little excerpt from Lincoln and the Bardo. Chapter forty-three. We found the gentleman, as had been described to us, near Bellingweather, husband, father, shipwright. Sitting cross-legged and defeated in a patch of tall grass. As we approached, he lifted head from hands and heaved a great sigh. He might have been, in that moment, a sculpture on the theme of loss. Shall we, Mr. Volman? I hesitated. The Reverend would not, would not approve. I said, the Reverend is not here, he said. Chapter 44. In order to occupy the greatest percentage of the gentleman's volume, I lowered myself into his lap and sat cross-legged just as he was sitting. The two now comprised one sitting man, Mr. Volman's greater girth somewhat overflowing the gentleman his massive member existing wholly outside the gentleman, pointing up at the moon. I think I want to play Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite something, quite something in there. Bevins, come in, I called out. This is not to be missed. I went in, assuming the same cross-leg posture. And the three of us were one, so to speak. Chapter 45. There was a touch of prairie about the fellow. Yes. Like stepping into the summer barn late at night. Or a musty plains office where some bright candle still burns. Vast, windswept, new, sad. Spacious, curious, doom-minded, ambitious. Back slightly out. Right boot chafing. The recent entry of the youthful Mr. Bevins now caused the gentleman a mild thought, swerved back to the scene from his own wild youth, a soft-spoken but retrograde, dirty cheeks, kind eyes, lass 
leading him shyly down a muddy path, nettles accruing on her swaying green skirt as, in his mind at the time, a touch of shame rose up, having to do with his sense that this girl was not really fair game, i.e. was more beast than lady, i.e. did not even know how to read. Becoming aware of that which he was remembering, the man's face reddened. We could feel it reddening at the thought that he was, in the midst of this tragic circumstance, remembering such a sordid incident. And he hurriedly directed his, our mind elsewhere, so as to leave this inappropriate thought behind. Chapter 46. Tried to see his boy's face. Couldn't. Tried to hear the boy's laugh. Couldn't. Attempted to recall some particular incident involving the boy and hope this might. First time we fitted him for a suit. Thus thought the gentleman. This did the trick. First time we fitted him for a suit. He looked down at the trousers and then up at me, amazed, as if to say, Father, I'm wearing grown-up pants. Shirtless, barefoot, pale round belly like an old man's. Then the little cuffed shirt and buttoning it up. Goodbye, little belly. We are insuring you now. Insuring? I do not even believe that's a word, Father. I tied the little tie, spun him around for a look. We have dressed up a wild savage, looks like, I said. He made the growling face. His hair stuck straight up. His cheeks were red. Racing around that store just previous, he'd knocked over a rack of socks. The tailor, complicit, brought out the little jacket with much pomp. Then the shy, boyish smile as I slid the jacket on him. Say, he said, don't I look fine, father? Then no thought at all for a while, and we just looked about us, bare trees, black against the dark blue sky. Little jacket, little jacket, little jacket. This phrase sounded in our head. A star flickered off, then on. Same one he's wearing back in there. Now, huh, same little jacket, but he who is wearing it is, I so want it not to be true, broken, pale broken thing. Why will it not work? What magic word made it work? Who is the keeper of that word? What did it profit him to switch this one off? What a contraption it is. How did it ever run? What spark ran it? Grand little machine, set up just so. Receiving the spark, it jumped to life. What put out that spark? What a sin it would be. Who would dare ruin such a marvel? Hence is murder anathema. God forbid I should ever commit such a grievous. Something been troubling us. We ran one hand roughly over our face as if attempting to suppress a notion just arising. This effort not proving successful. The notion washed over us. Chapter 47. Young Willie Lincoln was laid to rest on the day that the casualty lists from the Union victory at Fort Donelson were publicly posted an event that caused a great shock among, among the public at the time, the cost in life being unprecedented thus far in the war. Attribution in Setting the Record Straight, Memoir, Error, and Evasion by Jason Toom, Journal of American History. The details of the losses were communicated to the president even as young Willie lay under embalming. In Lincoln's Lost Angel, by Simon Inverness. More than a thousand troops on both sides were killed and three times that number wounded. It was a most bloody fight, a young Union soldier told his father, so devastating to his company that despite the victory, he remained sad, lonely, and downhearted. Only seven of the 85 men in his unit survived. 
in Team of Rivals, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln by Doris Kearns Goodwin. The dead at Donaldson, sweet Jesus, heaped and piled like threshed wheat, one on top of two on top of three. I walked through it after with a bad feeling. Lord, it was me that done that, I thought. In These Battle Memories by First Lieutenant Daniel Brower. The dead lay as they had fallen, in every conceivable shape, some grasping their guns as though they were in the act of firing, while others, with a cartridge in their icy grasp, were in the act of loading. Some of the countenances were a peaceful, glad smile, while on others rested a fiendish look of hate. It looked as though each countenance was the exact counterpart of the thoughts that were passing through the mind when the death messenger laid them low. Perhaps that noble-looking youth with his smiling, upturned face, with his glossy ringlets matted with his own life blood, felt a mother's prayer stealing over his senses as his young life went out. Near him lay a young husband with a prayer for his wife and little one yet lingering on his lips. Youth and age, virtue and evil were represented on those ghastly countenances. Before us lay the charred and blackened remains of some who had been burnt alive. They were wounded too. Oh, they were wounded too badly to move, and the fierce elements consumed them. In the Civil War years, a day-to-day -day chronicle of the life of a nation, a count of Corporal Lucius W. Barber, 15th Illinois Infantry. I had never seen a dead person before. Now I saw my fill. One poor lad had frozen solid in the posture of looking down aghast at his wound, eyes open. Some of his insides had spilled out and made, there on his side, under a thin coat of ice, a blur of purple and red. At home on my dressing table was a holy card of the sacred heart of Jesus, and this fellow looked like that, only his bulge of red and purple was lower and larger, and off to one side, and him gazing down at it in horror. From that terrible glory, a collection of Civil War letters from the men who fought it, compiled and edited by Brian Bell and Libby Trust. And Mother Fire had swept through the frozen dead and hurt where they lay. We found one still kicking among them and was able to bring him back still alive, not even knowing which side he was on. So burned was he and naked except for one leg of his pants. I never did hear how he made out, but it did not look hopeful for that poor devil. In Liter Letters of an Illinois Soldier, edited by Sam Westfall, account of Private Edward Gates, Company F, 15th Illinois Volunteer Infantry. Two or three of us would grab a fellow and haul him away just as we found him, as it was cold and the bodies were completely froze. That day I learned a person can get used to anything. Soon it all seemed normal to us, and we even joked about it, making up names for each depending on how it looked. There was bent over, there was shocked, there was half boy. From O oh, to be home again with you, letters from fallen warriors. Daniel Spence, editor. We found two little fellers holding hands, couldn't have been more than 14, 15 apiece as if they had desired to pass through that dark portal together. Unpublished Civil War Correspondence of Andrew Stark by permission of his family. How many more dead do you tend to make, sir, afore you is done? One minute there was our little Nate on that bridge with a fish pole, and where is that boy now? And who is it called him hither in that notice he saw down Orbeez? Well, sir, that was your name he saw upon it, Abraham Lincoln. In Country Letters to President Lincoln, letter from Robert Hansworthy, Boonesboro, Maryland. He is just one, and the weight of it about to kill me. Have exported this grief some 3,000 times so far to date. A mountain of boys, someone's boys, must keep on with it, may not have the heart for it. One thing to pull the lever when blind to the result, but here lies one dear example of what I accomplished by the orders I may not have the heart for it. What to do, call a halt? 
toss down the lost hole, those 3,000, sue for peace, become great course reversing fool, king of indecision, laughing stock for the ages, waffling hick, slim Mr. Turnabout. It is out of control. Who is doing it? Who caused it? Whose arrival on the scene began it? What am I doing? What am I doing here? Everything nonsense now. Those mourners came up, hands extended, sons intact, wearing on their faces enforced sadness masks to hide any sign of their happiness, which, which went on. They could not hide how alive they yet were with it, with their happiness at the potential of their still living sons. Until lately, I was one of them, strolling whistling through the slaughterhouse, averting my eyes from the carnage, able to laugh and dream and hope because it had not yet happened to me, to us. Trap, horrible trap. At one's birth it is sprung. Some last day must arrive when you will need to get out of this body. Bad enough. Then we bring a baby here. The terms of the trap are compounded. That baby also must depart. All pleasures should be tainted by that knowledge, but hopeful, dear us, we forget. Lord, what is this? All of this walking about, trying, smiling, bowing, joking, the sitting down at table, pressing of shirts, tying of ties, shining of shoes, planning of trips, singing of songs in the bath, when he is to be left out here? Is the person to nod, dance, reason, walk, discuss, as before? A parade passes. He can't rise and join. Am I to run after it? Take my place, lift knees high, wave a flag, blow a horn? Was he dear or not? Then let me be happy no more. Chapter 49. It was quite cold. Being in the gentleman, we were, for the first time in ever so long, quite cold ourselves. He sat distraught and shivering, seeking about for any consolation. Well, he must either be in a happy place or some no place by now, thought the gentleman. In either case, is no longer suffering. Suffered so terribly at the end. The racking cough, the trembling, the vomiting, the pathetic attempts to keep the mouth white with the shaky hand, the way his panicked eyes would steal up and catch mine as if to say, is there really nothing, Papa, you can do? And in his mind, the gentleman stood. We stood with him on the lonely plain, screaming at the top of our lungs. Quiet then, and a great weariness. All over now. He is either in joy or nothingness. So why grieve? The worst of it for him is over. Because I loved him so, and am in the habit of loving him, and that love must take the form of fussing and worry and doing. Only there's nothing left to do. Free myself of this darkness as I can, remain useful, not go mad. Think of him when I do as being in some bright place free of suffering, resplendent in a new mode of being. Thus thought the gentleman, thoughtfully combing a patch of grass with his hand. Chapter 50. And Lord, the fellow was low. He was attempting to formulate a goodbye in some sort of positive spirit, not wishing to enact that final departure in gloom in case it might be felt somehow by the lad, even as he told himself that the lad was now past all feeling. But all within him was sadness, guilt, and regret, and he could find little else. So he lingered, hoping for some comforting notion to arise upon which he might expand, but nothing came. Lo, colder than before, and sadder. And when he directed his mind outward, seeking the comfort of his life out there, 
and the encouragement of his future prospects and the high regard in which he was held, no comfort was forthcoming. But on the contrary, he was not, it seemed, well thought of or succeeding in much of anything at all. Thank you. Uh, basically, I was wondering where you got your conception of Lincoln. Can you name a couple of biographies that you read that maybe informed your picture of him? Yeah, that's great. You know, that was the big thing is I so much didn't want to do Lincoln ever, you know. So one of the ways I got around it was to say, you're not writing a biography. You know, you're actually, in fact, you're, I'm only doing Lincoln for about maybe three or four occasions for about that long, you know, just a quick minute. So my theory was... Um, uh, if I just read everything about him and everything by him, especially the speeches, uh, and just imagine like a big hopper on my head, put all that stuff in there, then forget it. Because uh, in this context, it really, for me, wasn't that important that I get Lincoln right as much as I get the dramatic moment right. So that means, y you know, you, you're kind of front-loading your head with his diction maybe and his, some of his logic. Uh, and then you're just waiting for the moment when you have to kind of do improv in his voice. So, I mean, it, it was really tempting. Like, he, at one point he said uh, so something that we might think of in this historical moment. Uh, he said, we must disenthrall ourselves, and then we will save our country, you know. So that, then I carried disenthrall around for a long time. Like, you know, <laughs> I've got to disenthrall myself and get the heck out of the screen, you know. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. But I thought if you, you know, his, his, um, his writings are so logical. He's such a syllogistic thinker. So that, I think, is the biggest thing that, that made its way in. That when he, even in extreme grief, you know, you can hear him in that section trying to kind of parse, take it apart a little bit and see how much of that grief he couldn't get away from and how much he could, you know. So it was mostly just um, the period and himself just loading in as much as I could. And then at the last minute, just saying, don't even think about it. Just, just riff the way you normally would. It, w it was one of the really um, scary things about this book is that I ca you can't do contemporary diction. So that was really kind of cool in a way because it meant that all my usual, like I couldn't use the word freaking, which is a real drawback, you know. <laughs> uh, super, you can't say super. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a nice, you know, mid to late life challenge to kind of take your, your familiar gifts and set them aside and see if there's anything else that comes to take its place. What writers influenced you the most? Um, I was an early Hemingway guy. I always make the joke that I had a, a Hemingway boner for about 25 years of my life. You know, I did, <laughs> couldn't do anything else. Uh, Hemingway was big, and then when I went to grad school and studied under Tobias Wolf at Syracuse, and so he, uh, and Carver was still living there at the time, so they were big influences. And then um, Toby turned us on to Isaac Babel, the Russian short story writer who's so wonderful. Uh, and also, you know, it's funny. I, this last semester or two years ago, I taught a, a Christmas Carol for the first time. And uh, I realized that Doug Dickens is my favorite writer. I think that, that it might be my favorite book. Um, and so those, th that was kind of the lineage. And then more recently, Alice Munro, of course, you just read her and go, yeah, <laughs> you'll never amount to anything, mister. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I, I think also, you know, a big, like Faulkner and Joyce, and they show up in this book a little bit. I kind of let myself indulge in a little bit of Joycean uh, stuff because I figured he's not born yet, so these ghosts are a little bit ahead of the postmodernist curve. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading Frederick Douglass lately, who I recently learned is still alive. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's doing incredible <laughs> things. And in exactly. He's so gonna go, he is going to go places, believe me. Indeed. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to finding yeah. out more about that. Yeah. So I wondered whether being in the Syracuse area where there is a certain amount of that history may have informed your process of writing the book as well. There was a stop on the Underground Railroad right there yes. that where I guess there was a CV, there's a CVS now or something, but. Yeah, yeah, the place is so rich that the Jerry riots were there and there was a sort of a utopian community and I can't remember the guy's name, but he was sort of the Bill Gates of the era and he spent the equivalent of millions of dollars uh, buying uh, slaves and freeing them and so on. Um, you know, we, we lived there, uh, we've lived there for years and raised our kids there and uh, at one point, we lived a couple blocks from the Erie Canal, so that period was really alive. Uh, so I, I don't know why it's interesting to me, except you know, with this book, one of the cool things is I, I read it. I read it. I wrote it. Well, I did also read it, but um, <laughs> but mostly I wrote it. Uh, but but then at the end of it, it was a kind. It's kind of corny, but it, you had the feeling of the country coming alive again as an active organism instead of just kind of 
thing on a shelf that, yeah, we're a capitalist democracy, we're great at that. It seemed uh, newly alive because of this period that I was reading. And then I went, uh, I finished this and I got a call from David Remnick, would you like to go cover the Trump campaign? And I said, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> I just wrote a novel, I'm gonna rest, you know? And my wife, as always, my best counselor said, yeah, you're going. I said, I don't want you, you have to go, it's a great opportunity. So I went right from this, you know, where you're in that really beautiful artistic mindset where the whole point is to not know, to, you know, to be comfortable with ambiguity, to confuse yourself, to have extreme love for your characters, even the bad ones, all that beautiful mindset. And then tumbled into the reporting mode, which in this case means watching all, everything on cable, getting into fights on social media and wallowing in that. And I was so struck by the difference in the mindset, you know, like in the art novelistic mindset, I felt very happy and slow and loving and not thrown by anything. And as I slo slowly, literally changed my personality, you know, by becoming a social media monster, uh, <laughs> I was snarkier, you know, more antagonistic. The whole thing is to get in and sting somebody. Ha ha, dumbass, you know. That <laughs> And uh, so, I, I mean, I, I was sort of struck by how, um, what is that like, you know, multiplied by the millions of times we're on there every day. And I've come to think with a little bit of distance on that Trump reporting that that might be the big story of our time right now, is the, those two modes, which are both okay, you know, they're both uh, mindsets. But if you think about w the way y you thought a year and a half ago, the way you reasoned, the way you felt, and the way it is now, for me, it's a big difference. You know, now partly it's events, but I'm also thinking that, you know, we're, we're literally changing human consciousness with this stuff, you know, and, it, and uh, so now what to do about it, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, but anyway, that, that doesn't answer your question, but it's a, it's a tangent, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Laura Miller criticized this novel as not being right for this moment in time in Salon. Uh -huh. And I actually have read it and I sort of, disagree with her because I think it actually is the perfect book for yeah. this time. What do you think of I, that I criticism? I agree with you. <laughs> 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 no, I, I mean, I d it was, um, after I, fin you know, it's funny because th this is insider baseball, but we, I finished the book uh, probably two years ago and there was some thought about putting out last fall and we were all like, well, that would be bad because it'd be in the middle of the election and everybody would be thinking about politics. So, you know, so, so, but I, I think, you know, in a certain way, uh, uh, Laura's a great, she's a really wonderful critic, and, and I kind of see what she means. My take on it is that a novel is, you know, it, it's not meant to be a stopgap. It's not meant to address the historical moment. But honestly, if I could, you know, if you could say, press a button, tell us your vision of America right now, even in, with Trump, that book is, is it, you know? Because for me, it was about kind of, uh, I mean, you know, a novel is always about a lot of things, and the things that you can articulate is not really what it's about, hopefully. But for me, it was kind of what I felt when I was done with it was what a beautiful idea we had here in America, how consistently we failed to live into it, but that, that, that we still could, you know, uh, that it was possible. And it's real simple. It's like this radical idea of equality that is so radical and simple that we've never been able to pull it off, really, except in fits and starts, you know. Uh, I went to, after I finished this book and I was on the Trump thing, I, I when I do these nonfiction things, I try to just like 24 seven report the piece. So I went up to Flagstaff to a Bernie rally up there. And having finished this book and then being in that crowd, it was the most beautifully diverse crowd. I mean, in every direction, every race, every gender, every eth everything. Uh, and he gave a political speech. I've never had this happen in my life. I agreed with every word he said. <laughs> you know how normally you, you're a politician, even when you like, you're kind of like, y yeah, sure. <laughs> I think that's, there's something to that, yeah, you know. <laughs> this is just like, it was like orgasmic how, how, you know, his vision of America was so radical and progressive and inclusive. So I left there thinking that's, that's the future of America, you know. And here we go, you know. <laughs> but, so, but so anyway, I don't, I think a novel, first of all, you, it's a five-year gestation, so you couldn't predict. And uh, hopefully a novel is, you know, working on a level that uh, it should be, if you're writing about love and loss and truth and beauty, it should be applicable in any time, I, I hope. Thank you. I'm pretty confident that you just answered my question, but <laughs> I will be a first time reader of yours tonight. My friend was really lovely to bring me. Um, but given the state of the world and everything, do you, I'll never have this opportunity again to ask an author what their recommendation of their work would be. So if you have a recommendation, what of your books should I read first? 
you should buy seven copies of this one. <laughs> Read it seven times. No, I think, uh, I, I don't know, actually. I mean, I, I, uh, I would probably s have somebody read 10th of December 1st. I think that's a pretty good entryway, I think. But you do have to have multiple copies to really understand it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is from 10th of December, actually, so I'll just segue off of his. It was a two-page uh, you know, story. I was blown away by how you could take a story and encapsulate it in such a short period of time, and I just really wanted to hear how you approach something like that. That's an amazing constraint. Well, th yeah, that was a story called Sticks. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you. I, I'm a usually my shtick is I revise amazingly. I'm, I'm <laughs> an obsessive reviser, and that story took me 30 years, and I still don't like it. But that one, I I literally wrote it at work uh, w years ago when our kids were little, and I just had finished another story. And I gave myself a challenge of writing two two-page stories in a day. And that was one of them. And it was pretty much just typed. I just type it up. And then the other one was lost to, the, to time. But uh, yeah, that was one. I, we, were at, um, we were going to the church. And uh, there was a guy who lived in the corner near our church. And he had this weird metal pole set up, which he'd decorate for the holidays. So he'd, he'd put a Buffalo Bills jersey on it and a helmet, you know, or he'd put a, a ghost costume. So I just was, th I was thinking about that, and that story is just a riff on that idea, I think. Because at first I thought, what a weird dude. You know, get, get a life. And, uh, and sometimes what I find is my first ideas aren't the most <laughs> generous. And so, so if you flip them, so what I thought was, let me, well, okay, what if that was actually a sort of a positive thing that he was doing? You know, and I kind of thought, yeah, I don't have my shit together enough to have a pole in my yard, you know. <laughs> so I kind of took it, you know, tried to look at it that way. But, but then I published that in a small magazine, and I just kept trying to put it in a book, and it didn't, it was about 15 years before it found its way into that book. But. So I'll also be a first-time reader tonight, and I'm very excited about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and while I was listening to the, the reading up there, I was struck by how sincere and loving the portrayal of, Lincoln's son was and I'm curious if you know as a father yourself if it's almost scary to let yourself get into that that vulnerability and that mindset and also how how would you advise another writer to let themselves get to that place yeah that's a great question I actually think part of the reason I didn't do this was because just because of that our kids were little um, but there is kind of a funny thing. My daughter asked me this the other day. You know, she said, oh, uh, you know, did you, like, was it hard for you to do that? And there's a kind of a funny, uh, I can't, I won't be able to describe it, but if you're a writer, you know, when you're doing an internal monologue, you're not, it's not like character acting, you know, where you're trying to make yourself cry or trying to move yourself. It's something a little more clinical than that, you know. So what I, what I would find is um, I kept thinking about, my mind would go as far as the extent of my love for them. That was all I actually needed, you know, to, to have known uh, what, what love of that type feels like. Then you just stop there, and then it becomes a little more stagecraft, you know. I, I, don't, I don't think um, you have to really be in the mindset of somebody to describe them. I, I don't think so. It's, it's much more like a magician. You don't, you don't actually cut the woman in half. You kind of just have to look like you're doing it a little bit, you know. Uh, but one of the thing you this th one of the things that's weird for me is I m if you read my earlier books they're very they're f you know ostensibly funny and kind of dark and they they move by jokes and by kind of a dark vision and it's actually an in I mean it's sort of an insecurity of mine if I if I'm nervous I'll make a joke like the first girl I ever dated uh, she she said um, uh, you know I I really I I don't think we were doing very well because all you ever do is joke. And I told it, I made a joke, <laughs> and then she, she <laughs> broke up with me. But, but so that, I mean, but so that's what, you know, when I tell my students at Syracuse, you, you sort of always, you can't be anybody but who you are as a writer, as an artist. That's the first move we all try to do. You know, like I'm a really sentimental person, really sarcastic person, uh, insecure, and defend myself with jokes. So for a lot of years, I just try to get rid of all that and just be a cool intellectual, you know. And then at some point you realize you have to use, just like in personality, you have to use what you have. So that's what we do at Syracuse is try to get people to fess up, not even articulate, but to feel what their strengths are. And even if those strengths have been historically in their mind negatives, uh, try to write through to where it's actually a virtue. So now having done all that, I, I think I came to kind of a good accommodation in the last book with, those, with funny and earnest. 
But then this material actually was different. It's a funny book in other, in other parts of the book, but it was really interesting to do just what you're saying. Like, how close can I get to my own actual feelings without the bottom falling out of the prose, you know? So that's, but I think that's it. For me, that's the beauty of, of the artistic life is you, you put all your shit on the table and you don't like most of it probably, you know? If you're like me, like, ugh. Uh, and then over the years, you get into contact with it and you can see that every detriment has kind of a flip side that's a virtue if you work it hard enough, you know? And then hopefully by the end of your life, I mean, my goal would be to be able to represent all the positive valences in life without flinching, but also all the negative valences in life without flinching. And then just let those two things kind of resonate there. Like, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's how it is, you know. <laughs> I, I, when I was younger, I uh, had to go to a funeral, and it was just the deepest, saddest thing imaginable. It was in, in the, out in the West. And uh, we came out, and across the street there was a Chuck E. Cheese and the kids were pouring out, and the guy who played the rat or whatever it is they have over there, <laughs> he, he comes out without the head on, you know? And you're like, ah, oh, there, such as it is, you know, that's, that's the way life is. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I am a huge fan of a lot of your short stories, um, and I, I'm a huge fan of a lot of the endings of a lot of your short mm -hmm. stories. And just from like a point of view of craft, um, when you start writing, how often do you start with the ending in mind or do you write your way into these things? Yes, yeah, almost never with the ending in mind for me. Wow. Uh, yeah, what, what I, my, I mean, again, this is not, sorry, this is not for everybody, but what I figured out was the, the less I know at every point, the better. Like, uh, uh, Bartholomew May had that thing, you know, the, the writer is that person who's embarking on her task, has no idea what to do. And then, so the idea would be you kind of go in and instead of trying to, uh, make up some conceptual or thematic goal, you just see what the prose is telling you. You know, li like Stuart Dybeck, that great Chicago writer says, the story is always talking to you, but you have to learn to listen to it. So then that's when it gets personal. Like for me, it's mostly an ear thing, uh, language and maybe jokes. Uh, other people I know have uh, structural ideas about it, but whatever you really have a, a strong opinions about could lead you from moment one to moment two. That's, that's the theory. And for me, a lot of it has to do with revising, like I'll, I'll get into a thing, and almost for like draconian revision, like um, j just to try to, to tweak the language until I like it. And then weirdly, that'll produce the next, the next thing. And then so the, the overall effect is kind of like painting your, pain yourself out of a room, although I don't know why you'd ever do that, but you, you paint and everything over here looks pretty good and you wouldn't change a word and then you see that you're at the end and you just got a couple of options, you know. So that, in stories, that's, that's the way it worked. This book was a little different. I had a little bit of a, like a maybe a three or four point outline that I could, could work through. But I, you know, there's this, uh, there's something really deep about that because my early stories that failed, they always failed from condescension, you know, because I had something I wanted to show you, you know, m about my trip to Europe or, or, you know, the meaning of life. And, then uh, you're in the position of a bad date, you know, like I got my index card that I'm, you know, 7.30, compliment her outfit, you know, that, <laughs> so it's, so you, what you get in that transaction is you get all the power, you keep all the power and you don't have to have the anxiety of uncertainty, but what you lose is that, you know, the intimate connection. So uh, Gerald Stern had this great line that I always quote, uh, probably too much, but it's, um, uh, when you start out to write a poem about two dogs fucking, and you write a poem about two dogs fucking, then you wrote a poem about two dogs fucking, you know. <laughs> so. And then and then Einstein's version of that is, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they hung out. Uh, it's uh, no, no worthy problem is ever solved on the plane of its original conception. So so I love that, you know, that your job as a writer is to lose the path a little bit and then s let the let the forest start talking to you a little bit. And s you know. Thanks. Um, I was struck by the fact that there was so much. Uh, historical nonfiction in your fiction book. I mean, almost a feel of like um, Ken Burns Civil War uh, documentary, and I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, really, wh what happened was I'd heard that story about Willie Lincoln way back in the 90s, as I said, and uh, in the intervening years, I kind of, you know how you sort of tell your, s you, by imagining something, you're essentially novelizing it. You're telling, you're dressing it up a little bit. Uh, and I just felt like when, if the, if the point of this book was the emotional core of that story, then I kind of needed the supporting stuff. You know, I needed to know, there's a famous party that the Lincolns threw, um, and the night of the party, which is a big boisterous thing at the White House, uh, Willie took a turn for the worse, and he actually died a couple weeks later, uh, 
you know, kind of, not because of the party, but it kind of felt like that to some writers at the time, and I think maybe to the Lincolns. So then you have to get that party in there somehow. And, um, you know, enacting that highest of, of fiction principle, which is don't suck. <laughs> you know, I, I tried to write the party in a sort of third person thing, and it just was dead, you know. So then I thought, well, how do I, how do I know about it? And it was just the history, you know. So it was really, uh, and this one, I didn't want to write a novel, as I said. And so my whole thing was to kind of look at it like you would a home invader, like, hey, what are you doing in here? You know, don't, don't stay too long. Uh, <laughs> and the other mantra was kind of like, wh what am I, why am I doing this? And I had to admit it was for the emotional, the really very dark emotional thing. You know, this idea that, um, w you know, we seem to be born here born and put here to love each other. We do that so naturally, and when we lose track of everything else, what does your mind go back to? It goes back to the two or three people that you love. Uh, so that's good, and then coming down the track is, is this big train with a sign on it that says, I am death, destroyer of worlds, you know, and it's coming for us, and it's coming not only, I can live with it coming for me, kind of. <laughs> I, I can live with it coming for you, <laughs> but when you think about living, you know, really, coming for everybody, you know, the people that you care about. That's really weird. So the book, I wanted the book to sort of sit on that idea. Uh, and the history stuff came to seem really important in, in kind of teasing out the emotion of that, if that makes sense. And let's give a nice round of applause Thank to George so Saunders. Much.